Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. The purpose of the Inside Job Meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous is to focus on exposing the fatal nature of alcoholism, the recuperative powers of the ego, the selfish characteristics of self, and how they function within the alcoholic. The message of recovery can sometimes be challenging to hear or understand, so exposing the disease in this way can make it easier to comprehend. Alcoholics Anonymous is an experimental program carried through the language of the heart. There is no right or wrong way to share your experience. It is, it's your experience. Please be open and express how the disease of alcoholism functions in your life or anything else you feel helps treat your disease. The message of recovery can get lost in the rat race of alcoholism, but alcoholism is treated through the application of the principles within the 12 steps so that a change of character is possible. Without a change of character, the disease will remain untreated. Okay, so I, I'll share. Um, Craig, I'm an alcoholic. And thanks, Juliet, for asking me to come here. It's a good group. Uh, I'm uh, from the primetime group, which is a, a cousin of this meeting. Uh, we're related. And the message uh, that, um, you know, it centers in our mind. All the readings were great because I, uh, I have fully conceded to my innermost self that I'm an alcoholic and I can never drink successfully again. Um, but that's that's a concede is the word admit. <laughs> admit in the first step we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. Admitting is something done reluctantly. I'm complying. I'm yeah. I admit it. Just get you off my back. But one of the definitions I heard is really good of admitting. It's it's uh, you know you stole that Craig. No, I did. Yes, you stole it. No, I didn't. You, we have you on video stealing this. Now I admit it. <laughs> See, I have to be cornered. So almost none of us like to admit we were real alcoholics, that we are indeed bodily and mentally different than our fellows. You know, we come here in the first half of step one, and that's what we talk about. There's two parts of step one for me, for prime time. Uh, they're separated by that dash, which in the English language connects the two statements that our lives have become unmanageable. I got here because my life became very unmanageable at 50 years old from drinking New Year's Eve. But that, that can stand alone, too. So the only time alcohol is mentioned in our steps is in the first half. I'm powerless over alcohol, and yes, I got here because my life seemed very unmanageable, but I didn't know that alcohol was and drugs were my solution because Dr. Silkor says that we're restless, irritable, and discontented unless we can experience the sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks we see others taking with impunity, but for us, what happens, the phenomenon of craving occurs. This is the allergy he talks about. And we go on a spree, ending remorseful, and this is repeated over and over. And unless we can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of our recovery. So Dr. Silkworth was the closest thing to a rehab back then. He knew our nature, but he didn't know how to create a spiritual experience like that, a, a vital a, a something, because you see, we're all very spiritual people. We lifted our spirits with liquid spirits, or smoke spirits, or whatever, powders, but you know, we couldn't live in the world we were at because we're restless, irritable, and discontent. And I can still be that way today. Time does not treat it. Over any considerable period, I get worse, never better. I am, I'm under the grip of a progressive illness. That's why so many people with 20 or more years who decide to drink and use again, they go out and they picked up where they left off. It, it seems like people that are heroin addicts tend to die from that relapse because their body can't handle what their mind was used to. So I know that physical part, but you see, I'm also progressing in here. My disease centers in my mind. And you know, the big book never called it a disease. It called it an illness. And But it, on page 64, in the fourth step, it says that resentments are the number one offender, and they destroy more alcoholism than anything else. And from it, are cause all forms of spiritual disease. That's the only time it's mentioned as a spiritual disease. And once, um, you know, the, 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 the we have this physical and mental 
obsession that once the, the spiritual uh, malady is overcome, we straighten out me me mentally and physically. So, you know, it's a spiritual program. Um, in we agnostics, the very first paragraph, if you're not sure you're an alcoholic, if when you sincerely want to, you find you can't quit entirely, or if when drinking, you can't control the amount you drink, you're probably an alcoholic, plain and simple. And if that be the case, you suffer from an illness which only a spiritual experience can conquer. So this is where we get into, you know, it then goes on to say, hmm, you know, this is a hard pill for some people to sw not swallow. To be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not always e easy alternatives to face. And it seems funny, right? I, I, you know, but people actually, like, Bill story that he went and killed himself because he didn't like the, the this is what I got to do. I don't want to live. So that's with the tragedy, I listening to my mind because it creates horrible scenarios. So what we talk about is in the day we're in, it's a moment by moment awareness of who I am and what my mind is trying to do to me. Alcoholism is, uh, you know, it's an ism. It is in me, though I have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind about it, because it seems that way. When I'm in it, I, there's no way out. That's why it takes the power greater than any human power. But recovery doesn't mean I'm cured. I just went through this with somebody that I know very well. Because on page 86, it says, we are not cured of alcoholism. What we have is a daily reprieve, contingent on the maintenance of that spiritual condition. So assuming I get a spiritual condition, then it's up to me in the day that I'm in to keep it going, you see. So, you know, these steps really work, and it, what it does is gives me tools for living because I don't know how to live on my own. And that's why I drank and used it for 36 years. And it worked for a while. Uh, I was somewhat functional. You know, I grew up with the Beatles, and, you know, they did drugs, I did drugs, you know, was a, they did ass, I did, I know, all that stuff. I was a good uh, wine and beer drinker, I could drink hard liquor. But, you know, I never would consider myself an alcoholic until I got, you know, put into rehab at 50 years old and uh, by my son and, uh, and realized, wow, you know, I blacked out. I was a blackout trooper, not all the time, but, so I had to fully concede, like, you know, I was arguing a little at first. I knew I couldn't do the thing that got me in there. Um, but, but I, I, you know, um, I had to really concede it, no mind altering something, nothing from the neck up that <coughs> alters my mind. Um, so, you know, uh, it's not an easy thing because like I said, alcohol and drugs were my solution. It was my coping <laughs> for many years. Now I'm feeling all these uncomfortable feelings and how do I live? How do I live without my medicine? So this is where I go on a journey of step one, and that, you know, where my life is unmanageable. For me, I know I can't drink anymore, but my life is unmanageable by me as the power for my life. I never realized that I was a power greater than, you know, I was the power for my life. So I need a power greater than me, greater than any human power, which in step two is just a willingness to believe that there's something. They don't, you know, and if I'm saying I will not believe, that's a really closed mind. But as soon as a man can say that he's willing, then we assure him he's on his way. And it's so simple in the big book because they give us permission. I grew up in a church. I was very, very devout. And I still am, but it's it's opened up in a way where I'm not set by rigid man-made rules. I'm, I'm a spiritual person, and I don't let any religion or person or anything... <coughs> Squash my spirituality, because spiritual stagnation is one of the, the greatest sins there is. It's always about my own personal quest for this thing I call God. It's the God of my understanding. If you have a trouble with that word, it says you don't need to believe in anybody else's concept. Your own concept, however inadequate, is sufficient to make the approach. And, you know, can I consider the possibility of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe, underlying the totality of things. I like that. Very scientific. I can consider that. My mind is open to that. I may not know how to access it yet, but once I open my mind of the possibilities, because you see, we come into AA, and some magic happens, and that's because whatever God is, is working through AA. It's manifesting in a three-dimensional plane here, and we get to express it. 
with the language of the heart that this format says. I heard something when I got here. I didn't want to be here at 50 years old, but I eventually, you know, took to it, and I really went for it. My life became important to me. I did struggle for my first couple of years because I was trying so hard. I couldn't get it. I wanted relief from the incessant, imminent doom that my mind was producing about everything. There was no, it was a seemingly open state of mind and body, sober. And that's what we're here for today. Because if it was as easy as putting the plug in the jug or putting down the pipe or the needle or whatever, we wouldn't be here tonight. We're here tonight because we have a disease called alcoholism. It was classified as a disease by this Dr. Harry Tebow, who was a member by proxy. He wasn't an alcoholic, but he studied us in the early 40s. And his first uh, client, Marty Mann, a woman, was the first woman to get sober. She didn't stay sober, but he gave her the book of the first 400 books, and she read it, and something happened. She applied those things. You'll hear me quoting a lot of information. It's just information. Information is barren if I don't demonstrate it in my own life. If I don't apply it, it's just knowledge. Head knowledge does, you know, self-knowledge avails us nothing, it says on page 39. So knowledge is good, but we can have, bar our, our faith can remain barren if we're not really going for this. And, you know, it says in the big book, for faith to be vital, it must be accompanied by self-sacrifice and unselfish constructive action. And I can't do that until I've changed this character. Because I came here, I didn't think I was such a bad guy. I didn't think I was selfish, but I was. I was jeopardizing my family, my kids. And though I wasn't like, I was still a giving person, selfishness, self-centeredness, that is the root of all troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate, sometimes seeming without provocation. But at some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self and ego that later placed us in the position to be hurt. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves. And we are extreme examples of self-will in life, though we usually don't think so. This is all in the book. I'm trying to put it together in a way that will make, you know, because you're reading the book, it could get, this is what I've learned, and this is how I apply it in my life. There's knowledge there, but I have to always remind myself of this stuff. So I can't get rid of this selfishness on my own, no matter how much I wish or try. I had to get rid of it, because if I don't, it kills us. But God makes it possible. So, you know, once I put down the idea, in step three of the big book, you know, that I had to, be convinced that any life run on self-will could hardly be a success. That's the first requirement. And so that's a hard one because I have, I can't stop drinking and using or whatever, but you know, I can tie my shoes, but can I? I can drive my car, but when I'm driving my car with me, I'm a very angry driver. Everyone's in my way. I'm impatient. I'm chasing, cursing, giving the finger to everyone. And if you do something wrong, I'll chase you down the road for miles. And to, to prove you right, because my ego is impatient, and it doesn't like to be frustrated, and it doesn't like to hear no. That's the character I brought here. It's still there, but it's buried way in the basement. And I have a big lock on it. And I, it's about that awareness to not allow my, my normal self, the lower self, to get a hold of me. It's the one that's watching is the higher self. See, we can never get rid of self. What we want to do is attain a higher self, the one that God wants us to be, because our whole problem has been the misuse of willpower. And our whole job in step three is to realign our will with God's intention for us, whatever that might be for you. It takes a lot of humility, this whole thing. Every step, the foundation principle is humility. In step one, I get humiliated from the pummeling. You know, I get beaten to a state of reasonableness from alcohol where I'll come in and I'll consider what you guys are saying. And then step two, and, I, and then I'm, I'm under the lash of alcoholism, I'm driven to AA, and there I discover the fatal nature of my situation. Sober, fatal nature. And then and only then do I become as open-minded to conviction and willing to listen as the dying can be. Are you listening as the dying can be? Or maybe you're thinking about what you're going to eat later. I wish this guy would shut up. You know, this is what my mind does. You know, uh, what's he talking about? I guess he think he, you know, that this is my judging mind. This is what I do. And I recognize it now, and, and I ask, who can you, God? Could you help me right now to not, you know, bless that. Bless that thought. You know, bless them, change me. Bless them, heal me. It's constant awareness. 
Emmett Fox says, constant, unceasing vigilance. I need to watch my thoughts and not get, let them run me. If you want to be the king of your kingdom, you have to be the gatekeeper of the secret place, your consciousness. Because the only thing that's real in this universe, according to some, fit, some metaphysicists and physicists, is consciousness and the information that's held there as truth. You know, oh, well, no, there's a table here. If you saw the matrix, it's this table here. You're telling me this table, okay? Well, my hands, the electrons aren't hitting, you know, the table. Like when you get into quantums, you won't believe how crazy this universe is. Quantum and terminal. But, you know, these electrons are repelling this. My eyes see it, and they did the information to my head. And so if I was fed, fed this information some other way, like in a dream or whatever, it would seem real to me. It's only what my mind tells me. So it's truth or it's not truth. The problem is, is I create scenarios of misinformation. And this is where I do things like in the Lord's Prayer. I love Emmett Fox. I, it's like this is where our program came from. Bill and Bob loved him. They used to go see him in 1935. He had just come out with Sermon on the Mount. He was doing big lectures at Carnegie Hall with 5,000 people, and they would go after their meetings to see him. And a lot before they wrote the big book, before Bill actually wrote the big book, they they, they used that in the Bible and uh, varieties of religious experience by William James and other things. And but then they eventually wrote the book with the 12 steps because the first original alcoholics used the the uh, Oxford group's six steps which was complete deflation with the first step. What does that mean? Devoid of ego. Complete deflation. I am deflated. I will listen. Because as long as I think I still have some power, see, I'm in trouble. That's why the ego, you know, you hear the saying, the ego is not my amigo, and that's the truth. It's always lying to me, and it's always getting me in trouble. It always has to be right. You know, it's defiant. It's impatient. <laughs> So when you're in that line at the market and everybody's going slow, it's a really test for me. I kept letting people in that had alcohol. I had a big order, and there, the line, there was only a couple lines open at Ralph's, and I did this big shopping for a meeting on Saturday. And, uh, and everybody, I had like five people, and I'm bouncing, boy, did I take the wrong line. And it was still taking so long. But I can see my ego and patience. You know, I, wanted to, I need to be somewhere else. So I just use it to pray. I'm right where I'm supposed to be right now. I get to let some people in front of me, you see. But when I'm in that line, and I need to talk to the manager. That person's got 12 items and a 10 item line. You know, I'm always arguing, and, 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 and the world is frustrating me because no one's doing it right. See, today I don't need to care what you do. I always used to care so much. Today, you can do whatever you want. I don't have to worry what you think of me. And because everyone has their own free will, and it's our nature to judge negatively. But we can judge positively, too. And this is where it all, we manifest outwardly what is really going on inside. Sometimes, some of it is so subconscious, so we can't tell. We don't know. And so it's a hard message to see that my life on the outside is a manifestation of what's really going on inside. And so, um, you know, and karma is so, you know, judge not or you shall be judged. Um, you know, so... This is all about a fourth dimensional application, you know, and that fourth dimension comes from there is a solution. And it says almost none of us like the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful consummation. That we saw that it worked in others. And we saw the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. Sober. When, therefore, we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, we had nothing left to do but to pick up a simple kit of spiritual tools, the steps, which had been laid at our feet, and been rocketed to the fourth dimension of existence, we had not even dreamed. Hmm. So, I had, you know, when you argue with this, what Einstein said, the fourth dimension is time-space. It's, it's uh, height, width, and depth, and time-space is the fourth dimension. But, you see, Emmett Fox was saying, Time, space, and matter. That was the three dimensions. And the next fourth dimension is the spiritual dimension. You can't weigh it. You can't see it. You can't measure it. It's, it, it's in the ether. It's something that comes from our consciousness. We're linked together. 
in quantum entanglement and there's frequencies. And when we're in the right zone, the God zone, when I tune into God channel, I can have this thing where we're all one and I can love each and every one of you the same way. But when my ego's in there, it's never happy to be one. I'm never a worker among workers or a drunk among drunks or a child, another, just another child of God. No better or worse. So it's, it's not a good place to be with the ego. So, you know, we have these amazing tools. And, and so I mentioned step two is just willingness. And step three, we make a decision to turn our will, which is what we want and what we do with it, and our lives, which we confuse with our living. Our living is the outside things, the job, the girl, the car, the money. That's an extension of what we are. That's the outside. But our lives is the nature of our very being, the core of our being, the eternal soul that goes on forever because we are energy. Energy comes from nowhere and it can never be destroyed. It's eternal. It transcends time and space. It's, this is scientific. You know. So I, I love science and I, I find God in it because it's so mind-boggling. I, I love whatever God is. I keep an open mind to that. And I, I bring in the love. God is love. Fear is man. There's only two emotions, love and fear. Keep it simple. Fear is a man-made construct. It's come throughout the ages. It's in our instincts. We were being chased by, you know, saber-toothed tigers and whatever. You know, there's an instinct of fear in us no matter what. But when I really trust in God and have the true realization that the will of God, this is Emmett Fox, and blessed of me, that the will of God is always something vital and wonderful and better than anything we can think of for ourselves. That's a good thing. Realization, it's a fact. There's no doubt. See, doubt is the greatest negative <clears throat> prayer there is. I'm not sure about that. See, that's where I'm arguing. And when I'm claiming doubt, I'm claiming that, that God's not powerful enough to do it. How big is your God? How big do you want this God to be? It's infinite. That one that has all power, all power, that one is God. May we find him now. It's always right now. Where the past and the present meet. This moment. That's, that's what prime time is. It's this moment. And so I try to stay there because when I go to the future, that's where fear definitely comes in. I'm running scenarios that may or may not happen. I'm creating havoc with alcoholism, which is a negative perception. Mm. And, and, or I'm going to the past full of regret and remorse and the depression. But right here, right now, I can find peace knowing that God will be there. See, nothing is either good or bad. It's thinking that makes it so. So this consciousness, I need to watch it with constant, unceasing vigilance. I do that today in the 10th step. I've taken four and five where I uncovered, discovered, and discarded. I prayed for all those resentments. I was just talking to someone about that because and it's so important to forgive these people. I do a two-week prayer based on page 552, the fourth edition. God, I, here are my resentments. May they all have health, happiness, and prosperity, and everything I wish for them be given to them as well. Amen. You know, and I do it every day for two weeks, even if I don't want to. Even if I don't really mean it for them, I do it, and I come to mean it. Something happens. Um, and then at five, I, I admit to God, myself, and another human, the exact nature of my wrongs, and we, you know. And six and seven are beautiful in the 12 and 12. I love seven. It's still beautiful. But in the big book, it's a ritual. You go home for one hour. Five, six, and seven are done in the same day. So I've taken it recently out of the big book and experienced that. And there's something that happens. And then we're already in eight and nine because we had a list from our four-step people we've gone and our sex inventory. But before we get too far in that, we don't want any new resentments to come. So we start on the 10th step. Because I don't want, you know, after my fifth step, I've kind of been given a new sweater. And I'm sitting around the fireplace of light, and the embers are coming on that sweater. And if I sit there, and this is what I do, and I'm like, oh, look at that damn ember of God. Why did it come on my new know, But if I just go like that, you see, there's no harm done. So the 10th step is to continue. We, we commenced this way of life vigorously uh, when we were going through the other steps. Now I have to continue to watch. That's step one and two in prime time. We're watching our alcoholism. Continue to watch for resentment, selfishness, dishonesty, and fear. There are the four carnal defects that we uncover in the fourth step and in the seventh step. <clears throat> and we ask God at once 
to, to, to direct our thing, to remove that resentment or fear, whatever. See, it's at once in the instruction. That's, that's steps two and three. So I got one, two, three, and four. We share it with someone immediately. That's step five. Because the longer I wait, the further it digs in. It's like a tick on my arm. If a tick lands on my arm, go like that. But once it digs in, it's going too far. And then, uh, is, that the, is that my time? No. So, um, and then um, uh, we, uh, we make an apology right away. That's eight and nine. So the first nine steps are right there in the tenth step. I don't have to keep going back to step one. Though I know it's part of it, and I can never drink again successfully again in the first step of step one, and that my life is unmanageable by me as a power. But what happens in the tenth step is a promise. By now, sanity will have returned. We cease fighting everyone and everything. This is produced as the results of these, these, these nine steps. Now, and I'm working 10, and I can go to 11, and there's when I retire at night, when I awaken in the morning. There's instructions and prayers through the day. And then, you know, and, and, and I can say, God, when I wake up in the morning, you know, first thing it says is, we ask God to direct our thinking that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, and self-seeking motives. And now we can employ our mental faculties with assurance. For after all, God gave us brains to use. Our thought lives will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is clear of all motives. See, it's all about a thought life. What is your thought life like right at the moment? You know, we come to meetings, maybe you're hearing something, maybe you like it, maybe you don't. It doesn't matter. All I can do is try to carry this message in step 12. We try to carry this message. And I've had a spiritual awakening as the result of these prior 11 steps. And, and I can try to carry this message to others. It's none of my business to get or not. And I practice these principles in all my affairs, especially my thought affairs, because what I think comes out in the outside. And it's just an amazing way to live, you know, and I'm so grateful for this today. I'm really grateful that I hit a bottom. And at the time, I didn't know how I was ever going to do it. It was a seemingly hopeless thing in my body, but I embraced this thing. I, I, I've accepted my alcoholism, and instead of fighting why, why, I know I have it, and I took these tools, and I brought them in my life, and I've had a complete shift. But I can lose it all. In step 10, it says, it is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We're headed for trouble if we do for alcoholism, son of foe. We're not cured of alcoholism. What we have is a daily reprieve. Contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Anyway. I could go on and on. You see, I, I, when I got to A, I hated it. I was arguing, and now I love it. I have passion. And I hope you all get passion for this as a way of life, okay? Thanks for letting me share. Uh, so, uh, oh, statement of purpose? No. Oh, what, oh, after the share, oh, oh, yeah. We will now pass the hat to observe the seventh tradition. Uh, we will now open a meeting for sharing or questions. Shares are limited to between two and four minutes each, so more people will have the opportunity to participate. The timer will give you a warning after two minutes so you can wrap it up. Sharing will end at 8.25. So there you go. Who would like to come up? Come on up. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Sure. Right. Yes. I'll take a hook, right? There you go. That's it. Thanks, I am James, <laughs> and I'm an alcoholic. Yes. I got a little wedgie, but I'm okay. Um, <laughs> judge with positivity. Yes. Righteous judgment. Oh my God. That's it. Have you changed? <laughs> um, you said about praying, the 14-day prayer thing. I've been doing this 14-day prayer thing. It's the fourth or fifth time now with the same person. I'm on this text chain with my sponsor and two of his sponsees, and every day is a new day of the 1 to 14. It's whatever day it is, it's like three. I'll put three in. And usually the first or second to wake up, and then the next person just puts three in. And the next person puts three in, and then the next day it's four. And the, the craziness is the resentment, I mean, is really, if I saw him, I don't know. But it's immense. My mind is not occupied by this resentment, which I have. Mm -hmm. And justifiable anger is really tricky. 
with an alcoholic mind, you know, someone, I don't want to put the energy out there at all, whatsoever. What I do instead is I pray for this guy. I pray that he gets everything that I want, that I pray that he finds love, he finds more love, he finds more wealth, he gets more real estate deals than I ever get, you know, all the things I want for him, and it's crazy. And the, the, the difference is I never think about this person, and it's a wonderful thing. Um, I'm still an alcoholic. I, I, I just celebrated 10 years sobriety. Thank you. Thanks. And I also celebrated a 40th birthday, believe it or not, and very close to each other. And um, I'm still an alcoholic. Two minutes. It's crazy. I, when I do these steps and I do this work and I, and I try to be positive instead of just negative judgment and catching that tick before it bur- burrows in. Oh, it's so important. The other day I was driving and that tick was right in my arm. And um, it's cool because it's not really crazy things these days. You know, it was a guitar. I played a guitar in a guitar shop and I was obsessed about buying it. And it just this, it was just like a this crazy thing drilling into my head. Like anytime there was any space in my day, like driving or something like that, I started to obsess about an object. And it was like, I was almost worshipping it. So, and the the justifications for buying this thing were crazy. And I just bought myself two guitars, right? And um, so I called an alcoholic and I said, hey, um, I think I'm like relapsing on this. He's like, oh, you're relapsing on drugs and alcohol? I was like, no, 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 no. That, That stuff's no way. I'm relapsing on like wanting to buy something. I just like, I've had this obsessive thought. It was incredible. Just talking to him, <laughs> hearing him and telling him, and I was like, oh my God, that sounds crazy. I just bought a guitar and another thing. Oh mm-hmm. my God. Like, and it's not the solution. I constantly go back to these instincts that other things outside of me are the solution. Uh, an object, a woman, or a thought about an object or a woman. And I obsessively think about it, and it's insane. Uh, but what I do want to say is that I'm so grateful to be here. I have definitely changed, and I continue to change. And I had a 40th surprise birthday party. And I've been terrified of people and terrified of attention all my life. And my wife told me, like, months ago, hey, you want a party? Like, no, no, I don't want the attention. Uh, you know, it's too much. Like, people are going to be looking at me and shit. I can't do the Irish goodbye. I'm going to wrap up with this. Anyway, it happened, and I loved it. I mean, it couldn't have been more awkward, but I didn't feel awkward. I'm, like, dancing with my mum with a live mariachi band surrounded by people with their cameras, and I didn't feel uncomfortable. Thank you, God. That's great. <laughs> Hi, I'm Casey. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Thank you so much for your share. Um, I'm sorry I came in late, and I like you know the second I came in and up the hall and heard your voice, I was like, ah, oh, yeah, this is like exactly the place that I want to be. You speak with such conviction, and I feel like that's one of the the biggest blessings about this program is that I really hear God speak through people, and that's that's incredible. I hear people with conviction, and I don't know that I always hear that out in the real world. Conviction is such a beautiful thing to have. It's such a blessing in this. I am. Um, I found out two hours ago that my best friend passed away, and she uh, she died of uh, an alcohol overdose, and it was a couple of days ago. My best friend in the world, and I. I don't need to. I don't need to really get into the specifics of it with you. I just want to speak to you from this place because I feel like, you know, we all know that like we're alcoholics and we all obviously know a whole community of other alcoholics. I don't need to explain to anyone here what it's like to, to have the shock of the grief, but to also kind of have that knowing at the same time of like, I, a part of me knew, and that's a scary thing, but, um, but we have this program and I just, I'm so grateful that I have this daily reprieve because it's this moment right now when it kicks into gear for me. Um, I had plans to meet with my sponsor before this and, um, and I found out like right before I was supposed to head out and I just, I knew like I have to go to a meeting, non-negotiable, non-negotiable. I, I, I don't want to be alone in my apartment. I don't want to 
bear this weight alone. I just want to be around other alcoholics. I want to hear the message. It's such a gift. It's such a gift to be able to wake up in the mornings and to, to pray and to meditate. And those are the things that I used to whine about with my sponsor. Like, oh, I don't want to meditate. Oh, I have to pray. Like, you know, that's, it's something that I look forward to every day. Um, and those two decisions that you had mentioned, I'm not, I'm going to misquote you on it, but between, you know, an alcoholic death and like a spiritual way of living, I just like such, such a miracle that we get that because it really is hard. And I like, I heard her struggle with it for such a long time. And like, I'm powerless over my alcohol, but I'm really powerless over other people's alcohol as well. Like I'm so powerless over the disease. It's, I'm powerless over your disease and I'm powerless over mine. And so I have to come here. I have to hear other people. I have to hear God speak through other people. Um, I'm so grateful to hear the message to you tonight. Thank you so much. Hi, my name's David. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, David. I'm sorry for your loss too, Casey. I lost a really good friend of mine like a year ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, it's really hard. It's good to see you. Um, you know, I, it's been really, it's been painful. I've been thinking, I mean, I think about him every day. He's my best friend since I was, you know, like four years old. And, um, you know, uh, Craig, thank you so much for your share. Um, you know, when you were talking in the beginning about, you know, you conceded to yourself, to your innermost self that you're an alcoholic, you know, so funny because I've been sharing about this a lot lately, but like, you know, for previous to this sobriety, like my last sobriety, where I had been sober for four and a half years, there was always the thought, that, like talked about in the beginning of the readings, you know, like there was always the thought in the back of my mind, like maybe one day it'll be different. And I really used to think, because people would say like, just don't drink for today. Can you just not drink or use drugs today? Just don't do it for today and worry about tomorrow or tomorrow. And like, I really used to think that one day at a time meant that one day I'll be able to drink. <laughs> you know, like it's funny, but like, I really believe that. And I know that there's probably other people in here that think that too, because I was actually talking about it with someone when I got sober again, six years ago, I'm six and a half, but it was, I was about six months sober at the time. And we were talking about it. And he was like, and he said to me, I told him that. And he said to me, yeah, that is what one day at a time means. <laughs> you know? And, and the crazy thing is, is that when I got sober this time, you know, I started listening to all those Bob tapes my sponsor gave them to me. Bob Anderson is the guy who, you know, kind of started Crime Time. And um, what he said, which was so impactful for me, was he said, you know, if I'm an alcoholic and I have alcoholism, then I, then for the rest of my life, I can't ever have alcohol. Like, if, if I don't accept that, you know, if I don't concede that to my innermost self, like, it doesn't matter if I write down all of my resentments. If I haven't conceded that, then then it's like, I, that's why I relapsed, you know? And what has been scaring the crap out of me lately is that, so I hadn't had that thought for, so I have, you know, I thought that I conceded to my innermost self, but what's been rattling me lately is that I've been having those thoughts again. You know, I've been having those thoughts that like, maybe now that I've got the job and the woman, like, fuck, dude, I can't believe that I'm, I can't, like, it's hard for me to believe that I'm actually, that those thoughts are going through my head. And so, you know, I'm sharing about it, uh, you know, because that's what I've been taught to do. And, you know, because I, I really don't want to relapse. And the fact that I'm having those thoughts, it's like, you know, scares the shit out of me because they're not really going away. Like, I don't give it energy. I'm aware of it. But then, like, a few days go, go by, and then I have the same thought. You know, I, I mean, like, granted, I'm an alcoholic, and it says that my great obsession is that one day I'm going to be able to drink and, you know, for me, use drugs like other people. So I guess it's really not that crazy. 
that I'm having the thought, those thoughts, but it is concerning to me, you know? So I just wanted to share it again. I'm um, sorry to sound like a broken record, but thank you. Doesn't mean it's real. So that's where the, the awareness, you know, don't give in to the evil. Lead us not in the temptation to do that, deliver us from evil. That's just a false belief that your mind is going to do stuff like that. Just don't attach to it. Don't dwell on that place. Ask God to help you. Anybody else? Yes, come on up. Uh, hi, my name is Josh, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Josh. Uh, right today, I'm uh, 413 days sober. So, oh, right. Right. so, <laughs> so um, yeah, um, I uh, I did um, I made a list of uh, you know. Um, of all sorts of things, of, of resentments and, and uh, lists of people and um, just all sorts of things. And then last Thursday, uh, I, I just uh, went through one by one and with my sponsor, and I just like told him uh, about all this stuff, you know, and, and, um, and just, it took, you know, hours. Um, it was so long. And, uh, you know, there were some in there that were just like really, really bad. Um, uh, you know, just like things that I had done to people for, um, you know, he's like, wow, you know, that, that was really, it's like really heavy. It's like really tough. Like, um, uh, for a while, like in Washington, DC, um, when I lived there, I was, um, I was like this drug dealer for a period of time. And, uh, I, um, you know, like just with anything, like it just started with me just like selling weed to, to smoke weed. And then, um, you know, it just got completely out of hand, you know, and then it was just like people, uh, you know, flying across the country and then sell, sending like, uh, you know, shipments of weed back and forth. And then and there was this one guy who, um, who, um, you know, like was like, uh, one of my friends was killed, um, and, and another one of my friends was, uh, like, was just, like, beaten, you know, to within an inch of his life, and, uh, his, you know, he, he never knew that it was me, you know, that, that, like, that had this, this whole thing in it, you know, and, uh, you know, and it was just, like, this really, it's just a thing that I don't think about, you know, like, a thing that I never really thought about for a really long time, my my sponsor and I were just like really talking about it, you know, um, for a while afterwards. And, um, and so then afterwards, you know, like I had this list of fears and I, um, and, and I said that and then, uh, and then he left. And so then, then there was this weekend where I was just like working at, at Universal Studios Hollywood, like for really like, um, just smiling and waving at people, uh, and, and I felt so good. And then today I have this like this really great opportunity to it's a work related opportunity that is a, in the creative field and it's something that I want to be doing. And um and I and I met with um with these like two women who I want to do a podcast and 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 I just felt like so good. I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm like things are like are happening, you know, like I'm like you know, things are coming together. And then I just had this, this really crazy sort of breakdown. Um, it was just like a few hours ago and, and I, I took my dog for a walk and I, I ate some food and I got here like two hours early. Um, and just like made the coffee and I set this, this room up like the moment that, um, I was like waiting outside. And then when I saw the guy like flip the thing outside the door, I knew it was unlocked. I just came in here and I, um, because I just like I was so uh, you know like shaken by um, by all of these things um, you know and and I think that there are things in, in me that want to just like tear things down you know like when things are good or that want to dwell on these on these horrible things or that want to avoid them entirely um, and it's just really uh, I'm glad that this is here today um, I'm glad that I'm here so thank you. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, thank you, Craig. 
I haven't seen you, um, I don't think ever, maybe, but uh, your message is really good. And um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, uh, primetime really like blew the gates open for me on, on what this thing is and what I'm up against. And uh, that was really like academic and in a way that like resonates with me. A lot of it didn't like actually stick because I'm mentally fatigued from obsessions all day. Um, but that is my alcoholism, and um, you know, I, I love. Um, recently, I've, I've uh, come to the awareness that, um, like, like a like a, a thing in like a circumstance in my life, and it's, um, it's a relationship potentially, probably one I shouldn't be involved in, but um, <laughs> it's really like ignited my obsessive mind. Um, but at the same time, it's re like reasserted my dedication to this work um, because I am a person who has always um, through born. I mean, I'm an alcoholic because I like to drink alcoholically. Like I will drink till I can't drink anymore, or use till I can't use anymore, and I like to do it frequently and compulsively. So like that's an alcoholic. Um, but beyond that, I have a tendency, what I've come to understand through prime time and, um, and other kind of self, um, kind of uh, discovery paths is that, um, I'm always perpetually looking for something to fix me because I feel broken through my, um, natural proclivity for alcohol or trauma or whatever it might be. I am convinced that there's something outside of me, similar to what James shared about his guitars. It's like there's something or someone outside of me that can fix me. And all those things, every time I touch them, I see a beautiful burning fire, whatever it may be. I want to touch it, and I always get burned because those things are always short-lived. And I have a one-bedroom apartment and four bicycles in there. And like, <laughs> like it's one, it's probably like three too many bikes. So I only really ride one. And uh, even rarely, even then. <laughs> so the bicycle, I tapped out on the bicycles, and now there's this girl, and uh, and she's doing my head in, and um, and it's just like because I want to be saved, and um, but in, you know through this work, and instead of like I, I turn my phone off for this meeting because I don't want to check it, you know I want to listen to you, I want to get present in, in a room that restore me to sanity. You know, and a program and that I owe that to, that presence, and, and to get up here and speak my truth, and hopefully, uh, you know, a newcomer can hear me or hear something I say or whatever. It's none of my business, but um, yeah, I just um, like there's nothing. I have to concede to me and myself. I'm an alcoholic, and the, the work is inside. It's an inside job, and it's a mental disease, and it's a disease of obsession and. Um, and as hokey as this still sounds to me, there's only one thing that can restore me, and that's God. And I find God in this room, and I find God through people that speak like you, and, and people that share earnestly. And just the fact of the matter is, like, we're all gathered here with a collective, like, intent, which is, like, to help ourselves, to fucking save our asses. And that's, there's something really beautiful about that. Um, and, and um, you know, so I got this burning house, that's in the form of a female over here, and um, and uh, yeah, I'm kind of like weirdly making an analogy. Like I want to stand next to it and admire it, and blah blah blah. We'll see where that all goes. I categorically know I can't drink or use um, to alle to alleviate whatever fallout might come from that. But I also know that like there's a path I'm on, and it's right here, and it's laid out right here, and it's in the big book, and it's in other forms of recovery for me as well, um, and and that's unwavering, and it can't be, it's not a compromise, it's an absolute, and um, I'm really really happy about that actually. So thanks. Okay. Good time for two minutes, sure. I'll go. Um, my name is Zach. Um, I am a. Um, I am a weed addict and speed addict. Um, Hi, Zach. Hi, Zach. Hi, guys. Um, it's good to be here today. Um, sometimes things get tough, um, and you have to just keep pushing. Um, I'm known for, um, for in the past, I've not been able to succeed when I've, when I've pushed kind of past my limit or pushed to a um, point. And there's a, there's a point in your life where you can either go upwards or downwards. Um, I'm juggling different things. Uh, my father is dying. 
Um, he abused me most of his life and convinced me to move back home and live with him, to live with him and help caretake for him. But at the same time, he's extremely abusive, which is um, difficult to handle. And I'm not quite sure what I want to do about that um, because I know I can move out and, and go with not having money for years or something like that. Um, but my point is I, I sat up and I said, you know, I don't want to stand for this. And I sent, um, I sent out 60 job applications every day for like four or five days. And I've got 12 interviews. Um, so you can do more than whatever you think that you can. Or whatever's going on in here that says that, that you're not good enough or that you're not smart enough um, or that you can't, um, I don't know, you can't, you need more sleep or you can't, um, can't hit the snooze button on the alarm. You can do more. Um, and it's hard and it takes time. And um, as alcoholics, we, we have those minds that want to go back to using. Um, I had a dream where I was smoking weed with friends. Um, it kind of turned into a nightmare. Um, but I do, I did still wake up with that haze of like, oh, like I do still have those tendencies to like use and my body wants to, to use and I want release. And um, sometimes it's hard to get that and you need other people. Uh, thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.